Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Shubha, Professor of Anatomy from Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences, Bangalore. Today, I am going to talk about mediastinum. Once, a consultant asked an intern, what was this case about? And the intern told, it's a case of respiratory disease, sir. Consultant asked the intern, how do you decide it is a respiratory case. The intern told the consultant that the patient had breathlessness. Consultant told the intern, look at this chest x-ray. What do you see here? The intern was shocked to see the cardiac shadow was much enlarged. Consultant told the intern, there are other reasons for this type of an x-ray. Let us have a look at what could be the other reasons? What are the structures in this region? So, today's lecture will be based on the definition of mediastinum, boundaries, the contents, subdivisions, clinical anatomy of mediastinum, then superior mediastinum, its boundaries and contents, coming to superior vena cava in detail, then we will go on to aorta, trachea, cardiac plexus and we will end it with the summary of the topic. Let us define what is mediastinum. Mediastinum means middle septum. It is the septum which is present within the thoracic cavity between the two pleural sacs. So, it is also bounded on either side by the mediastinal pleura. Let us look at the boundaries of mediastinum. Mediastinum is bounded anteriorly by the sternum, posteriorly by the 12th thoracic vertebrae with the intervening intervertebral discs, superiorly by the thoracic inlet and inferiorly by the diaphragm. You can also have a cross sectional view here and the mediastinum is bounded on either side by the mediastinal pleura. Let us look at the contents of the mediastinum. You can see the thymus which is highlighted there. This is a retro sternal content. It is just behind the sternum along with the veins. The main veins are the superior vena cava with its tributaries that is the brachiocephalic veins. In the intermediate part you find the pericardium with its contents that is the heart and the great vessels along with the phrenic nerve and the accompanying pericardiacophrenic vessels. Prevertebral contents are the trachea, esophagus which is accompanied by the two vagus nerves, the azygous venous system and the sympathetic trunk and its branches. You can also appreciate here the descending thoracic aorta and the pulmonary vessels. They are also part of the mediastinum. Now, let us look at the subdivisions of mediastinum. An imaginary plane which passes through anteriorly at the sternal angle and posteriorly at the lower border of the fourth thoracic vertebra will divide the mediastinum into a superior mediastinum and an inferior mediastinum. So, this is an imaginary plane dividing the mediastinum into superior and inferior mediastinum for descriptive purposes. Now, let us look at these 
subdivisions which are part of inferior mediastinum. So, we know superior mediastinum is above the imaginary plane, the inferior is further subdivided by the pericardium and its contents into an anterior mediastinum which is in front of the pericardium, a middle mediastinum which is within the pericardium and a posterior mediastinum which is behind the pericardium. So, the inferior mediastinum has got three subdivisions, an anterior in front of pericardium middle within pericardium and posterior which is behind the pericardium. Why is this mediastinum important? Mediastinum has got very little connective tissue binding the structures within it. Most of these structures are luminal, they have a lumen within them and there is very minimal amount of loose connective tissue holding these structures. So, when there is enlargement of these structures, so if there is a space occupying lesion in these structures, then there is widening of the mediastinum. It immediately accommodates the structure because of the minimal amount of the connective tissue which is also loose in nature. This is called as widening of mediastinum. If you recall the x-ray which was seen in the clinic in the earlier part of the lecture that showed widening of the mediastinum. The reason behind the widening could be due to any of its contents undergoing a uh, lesion or space occupying lesion present in one of the contents. Mediastinum can also be observed by putting a fiber optic scope into it. Usually it is done through the neck, it is called as cervical mediastinoscopy. It is many a times accompanied by biopsy of one of the structures like the lymph node, then it is mediastinal biopsy. Mediastinitis is infection of the mediastinum or inflammation of the mediastinum. Usually it is a spread from an infection in the neck because you find the prevertebral fascia in the neck descends down into the mediastinum and blends with the fourth thoracic vertebra. So, you find an infection which is present behind the prevertebral fascia in the neck will track down into the superior mediastinum, but does not extend into the inferior mediastinum because the fascia ends at the level of T4. So, the infection gets bound to the level of T4, does not descend down. The pretracheal fascia in the neck will blend with the arch of aorta. So, any infection in front of the pretracheal fascia can extend into the superior mediastinum and also descend down into the anterior mediastinum. Whereas, an infection present between the pretracheal and the prevertebral layers of deep cervical fascia can descend down into the superior mediastinum and also extend into the inferior mediastinum between these two layers. You find the mediastinum is occupied by the veins which are present mostly on the right side. The veins as we know will allow enlargement when there is an increased venous return, whereas the arteries usually have a constant blood flow. So, the presence of veins on the right side acts as a dead space within the mediastinum. So, any enlargement of structure within the mediastinum that is a space occupying lesion usually will project to the right rather than to the left because of the available dead space surrounding the veins present on the right side. Mediastinal syndrome, it is due to compression of mediastinal contents by a space occupying lesion like a tumor. So, what happens is it is associated with compression of various structures and the resulting symptoms and signs. If a patient has dysphagia, it could be due to compression of the esophagus unable to swallow. If there is dysphonia, if there is compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, 
there can be hoarseness of voice or loss of voice. There can be compression of the trachea itself, then a person will have dyspnea, difficulty in breathing. So, these are put together and called as mediastinal syndrome. Mediastinal shift is when the mediastinum which is a midline septum shifts to one side. If there is a disease like atelectasis, when there is a collapse of the lung, then what happens is there is decrease in the intrapleural pressure. Then the mediastinum shifts to the diseased side. If there is increased intrapleural pressure, for example, in diseases like pneumothorax, then you find the mediastinal shift happening towards the healthier side. So, a mediastinal shift can be appreciated by checking the or palpating the trachea in the suprasternal notch. In case of mediastinal shift, the trachea will be deviated to the corresponding side. Now, coming to the superior mediastinum, let us look at the boundaries of superior mediastinum. Superior mediastinum is bounded by anteriorly the manubrium sterni, superiorly by the inlet of the thoracic cage, posteriorly by the upper four thoracic vertebra and the intervening intervertebral discs, inferiorly by the imaginary plane which separates it from the inferior mediastinum. On either side, it is bounded by the mediastinal pleura. So, this is the mediastinal pleura on the sides. So, these are the boundaries. Above is the thoracic inlet, below is the imaginary plane, anteriorly is the manubrium sternum and posteriorly is the thoracic vertebrae upper 4. On either side, the mediastinal pleura. Let us look at the contents of the superior mediastinum. A retrosternal content which is present here is the thymus. In front of the thymus, you also find the muscles which take origin and go upwards into the neck. They are the sternohyoid and sternothyroid. So, just behind this, you will find this bilobed structure, the thymus. Thymus is present in the neck and also in the superior mediastinum behind the sternum. It is an organ which is present in children, keeps increasing in size up to puberty and thereafter it decreases in size undergoing atrophy. So, the maximum size is found in pubertal children. This releases a hormone called thymo thymosin and this helps in bringing about immunity. So, this is thymus. Let us look at the other contents. You find the upper half of the superior vinanceva present in the superior mediastinum along with its tributaries that is the brachiocephalic vein and right and left brachiocephalic vein. The next content which you see in the superior mediastinum is the arch of aorta. You also find the nerves that is the vagus nerve, the right and the left vagus nerves and the phrenic nerves, the right and the left phrenic nerves. In the prevertebral region, you find the trachea with the esophagus accompanied on the left side by the thoracic duct. You can also look at these contents in a transverse section. This is the thymus. In front of the thymus, this region will be occupied by sternohyoid and sternothyroid. So, these are the st structures present in just behind the sternum, retrosternal structures. You also find the superior vena cava and the brachiocephalic vein lying in the retrosternal region. This is the superior intercostal vein which is a tributary to the left brachiocephalic vein. It passes between the phrenic nerve anteriorly and the vagus nerve posteriorly. 
The next content which you see here is the arch of the aorta which is in intermediate in position with its three branches which you can see here. This is the brachiocephalic trunk, this is the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery. The other contents are the nerves which are also intermediate in position. This is the phrenic nerve which is found on both sides, this is the right phrenic nerve and this is the left phrenic nerve. Then you find the vagus, the right vagus and the left vagus and their branches which take part in the formation of cardiac plexus along with the sympathetic branches. These contents which we are now enumerating they are pre-vertebral in position. This is trachea, this is esophagus. You find the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left side, a branch coming from the left vagus lying between the trachea and the esophagus in the tracheoesophageal groove. Posterior lateral to this you will find the thoracic duct. So, those are the contents of the superior mediastinum. Now, let us look at each of this content in detail. Coming to superior vena cava. Superior vena cava is a large vein, the second largest vein in the body which is present in the superior mediastinum. It is formed by the union of the right and the left brachiocephalic veins which bring the blood from the head and neck and the upper limbs. They unite together at the level of the first right costal cartilage very close to the sternum that is the costosternal joint, you find the union forming the superior vena cava. This is about 7 centimeters in length. It is proximal part of the superior vena cava about 3.5 centimeters is extra pericardial. At the level of the second costal cartilage, it pierces the pericardium and enters the pericardium lying within the middle mediastinum and this is intrapericardial. The lower 3.5 centimeters is intrapericardial. Just at the level of the third costal cartilage, it ends by terminating into the right atrium, into the sinus venarum part of right atrium. That is where the superior vena cava ends. So, formation is by the union of the right and the left brachiocephalic veins at the level of first costal cartilage. Termination is into the sinus venarum of the right atrium at the level of third costal cartilage. So, it extends from first costal cartilage to third costal cartilage, 7 centimeters in length, proximal half that is about 3.5 centimeters is extra pericardial, the lower half that is the lower 3.5 centimeters is intrapericardial. It is going to enter the pericardium at the level of the second costal cartilage. That is where it is going to pierce the pericardium and become intrapericardial. When you look at the relations of the superior vena cava, you can see this is the superior vena cava. It is related anteriorly to the right lung and the pleura which separates it from the internal thoracic vessels of the right side and the right intercostal spaces. To the medially, medial side, it is related to the ascending aorta and the brachiocephalic trunk. Posterior medially, it is related to the trachea, esophagus and the vagus nerves. Laterally or to the, uh, to the right, it is related to the right lung and the pleura. It is also related posteriorly to the azygous vein. In the lower aspect, it is related to the right lung root. So, these are some of the important relations of the superior vena cava which we can appreciate in this transverse section which is taken at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebra. Let us look at the tributaries of superior vena cava. It has got formative tributaries that is the right and the left brachiocephalic veins. The other named tributary is the azygous vein 
which ends in the superior vena cava just before it pierces the pericardium, azygous vein. The other veins are the small veins that is the mediastinal veins which are present in the mediastinum and also the pericardial veins can end in superior vena cava. These tributaries will connect superior vena cava with inferior vena cava. You find the azygous vein which ends in superior vena cava has a communication with inferior vena cava. You also find the tributaries of the formative veins of superior vena cava are connected by indirectly to inferior vena cava through its tributaries. All these become important when there is collateral circulation happening. If the superior vena cava is obstructed, if it happens above the azygous vein, before azygous vein ends in superior vena cava, then you find superior vena cava can get obstructed above it. Then what do you see? You find the collateral circulation happening through the veins, through the intercostal veins and the azygous vein itself. So, you find the veins which are enlarged on the upper half of the body, they are the collaterals which are going to connect the upper part of the body veins with the azygous vein. So, through this the upper part of the body will be draining into the superior vena cava itself via the azygous vein. So, you find enlargement, venous engorgement happening in the upper half of the body. Whereas superior venancaval obstruction if it happens below azygous termination, then you find that superior venancaval has to have collateral circulation taking the blood to inferior venancaval. This you find via the tributaries of superior venancaval which communicate with inferior venancaval tributaries. One such tributary which connects axillary vein with the femoral vein is thoracoepigastric vein. This can be seen in the anterolateral aspect of the thorax and the abdomen being enlarged in case of superior venancaval obstruction below azygous vein. So, this tributary will be enlarged. This is thoracoepigastric vein. This will transfer the blood from the upper half of the body through these communications to the femoral vein and then the femoral vein blood will be transmitted into inferior vena cava and the heart. That is how the collateral circulation takes place. This is seen here. Superior vena cava obstruction will take the blood back through brachiocephalic veins, subclavian vein, then the axillary vein. Axillary vein is receiving lateral thoracic vein and lateral thoracic vein is connected to superficial epigastric vein through the thoracoepigastric which we saw enlarged in case of a superior venancaval obstruction below azygous. So, this superficial epigastric vein will be connected to the great cephalous vein, the femoral vein which drains into common iliac which forms the inferior venancava and this ends in the right atrium. That is how the superior venancaval blood is shunted to inferior venancava through this engorged vein that is the thoracoepigastric vein. This is called as cava venancaval shunt. Mediastinal syndrome, we already mentioned any space occupying lesion in the mediastinum will give rise to a collection of symptoms which is called as mediastinal syndrome. Signs of superior venancaval obstruction are the first to appear in the mediastinal syndrome. In a dissected specimen, this is how it is going to be seen. This is the superior vena cava. Here is the arch of aorta, here is the trachea and behind that is the esophagus. You can see the branches of the arch of aorta are present here. So, this is superior vena cava which is on the right side of the mediastinum. So, this whole area is between the two pleural sacs and the lungs. So, this area is the mediastinum. Since we are looking at the upper part, this is the superior mediastinum. So, this is superior vena cava. Next, going on to aorta, 
Aorta is the largest artery in the body. This has got three parts. It is going to arise from the left ventricle. From the outflow tract of the left ventricle, you find the aorta coming out. It has a proximal part which ascends up within the pericardium. This proximal part is called as ascending aorta. The next part which curves upwards and backwards and to the left, this is called as arch of aorta and this descends down from the left side towards the midline in the thoracic cavity. This is called as descending thoracic aorta. Once it passes through the diaphragm, aortic opening in the diaphragm, it becomes the abdominal aorta. So, this is the abdominal aorta. So, you find proximal portion is called as ascending aorta, then there is arch of aorta which continues down as the descending thoracic aorta. The beginning and the termination of arch of aorta is at the same level, that is at the sternal angle level or level of lower border of T4, thoracic vertebra 4. When we look at the ascending aorta, you find the proximal portion of the ascending aorta shows certain enlargement which are called as aortic sinuses of valsalva, aortic sinuses of valsalva. There are three aortic sinuses below the supravalvar ridge, you find three aortic sinuses. These aortic sinuses will show enlargement and two of these will give origin to arteries. The one which gives rise to the right coronary artery, it is called as anterior aortic sinus and the other two are the posterior aortic sinuses. The left posterior aortic sinus gives origin to the left coronary artery, whereas the right posterior aortic sinus does not give rise to any coronary artery, it is called as non-coronary sinus. These are the sinuses of valsalva, a slight dilatation which is found in the aorta, that is the ascending aorta. You find an enlargement or bulging of the aortic wall to the right side at the junction of ascending aorta with the arch of aorta, you find this part of the right side of the aortic wall bulges. This is called as aortic bulb. This is probably due to the force of the blood which ejects into the aorta forcefully from the left ventricle which keeps hitting this wall resulting in dilatation of this which is called as aortic bulb. The ascending aorta continues as the arch of aorta and this is at the level of the sternal angle which is towards the right side, the second costal cartilage. The arch of aorta and junction between ascending aorta and arch of aorta is to the right side of the sternal angle at the level of second costal cartilage. So, it extends from the third costal cartilage to the second costal cartilage. We can have a look at some of the relations of the ascending aorta. You can see the ascending aorta will be overlapped by these structures. One is the pulmonary infundibulum which gives rise to the pulmonary trunk. This overlaps the proximal part of the ascending aorta along with the right auricle. This is a projection, ear like projection from the right atrium, this is the right auricle. So, these three will overlap the anterior aspect of the ascending aorta, that will be the pulmonary infundibulum, that is the outflow tract of the right ventricle, then the proximal part of the pulmonary trunk and the right auricle, a projection from the right atrium. They overlap the anterior aspect of the ascending aorta. On the right side of the aorta, ascending aorta is the lower half of the superior vena cava along with the right atrium. On the left side, you find the rest of the pulmonary trunk, upper part of the pulmonary trunk 
along with its division into right and left pulmonary arteries. The right pulmonary artery will pass behind the ascending aorta. Behind the ascending aorta you also find a sinus, pericardial sinus. This is the transverse sinus along with the superior surface of the left atrium. They form the posterior relation of the ascending aorta. So, these are some of the relations of the ascending aorta. Next coming on to the arch of aorta which starts and ends at the level of the fourth thoracic vertebra. It starts from the right side of the mediastinum near the right second costal cartilage and ends posteriorly and to the left at the level of the fourth thoracic vertebra itself. Now, this arch of aorta is related anteriorly to the thymus. Anteriorly and to the left, it has certain structures here. One is the superior intercostal vein, which crosses behind the phrenic nerve in front of the vagus nerve. So, you find there are four nerves anterolateral to the arch of aorta. Anteriormost is the phrenic nerve, posteriormost is the vagus, in between are the two cardiac branches. The anterior one is the cervical cardiac branch of the vagus, that is the inferior cervical cardiac branch of the vagus. Posterior one is the superior cervical cardiac branch of the superior cervical sympathetic. These will go into formation of the superficial cardiac plexus. You also find the deep cardiac plexus in relation to the arch of aorta posteriorly, which is between the arch of aorta and the trachea. So, this is the deep cardiac plexus. So, posteriorly it is related to the deep cardiac plexus, the trachea along with the vagus nerve and you also find the esophagus posterior to the trachea, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve occupies the tracheoesophageal groove and posterior laterally there is thoracic duct. So, these structures are posterior and to the right of arch of aorta. That is the cardiac plexus, then you find the trachea with the right vagus, the recurrent laryngeal nerve in the tracheoesophageal groove, the esophagus and the thoracic duct and the fourth thoracic vertebra posterior to it. So, these structures lie posterior and to the right these structures are anterior and to the left. Immediately above the arch of aorta, you find the branches that is the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery. Below the arch of aorta, you find the pulmonary trunk dividing and you find the right pulmonary artery running below the arch. The left pulmonary artery proximal part is connected by a ligament with the arch that is called as ligamentum arteriosum. You also find the cardiac plexus that is the superficial cardiac plexus below the arch of aorta. So, these are some of the relations inferiorly to the aorta. Next going on to the descending thoracic aorta which is the continuation of the arch from the level of the lower border of fourth thoracic vertebra. You find this descending thoracic aorta will continue from the lower border of fourth thoracic vertebra till the twelfth thoracic vertebra. You find the descending thoracic aorta lying within the thoracic cavity in the mediastinum. Now, this is the arch of aorta which is continuing as the descending thoracic aorta. This is the trachea, you can see the trachea bifurcating here and the left bronchus crossing in front of the descending thoracic aorta. You find the esophagus which is on the right side of the descending thoracic aorta in the upper part comes to lie anterior to it with a pleural recess between the two forming the mesoesophagus in the lower part. So, you find it is an anterior relation in the lower part, the esophagus to descending thoracic aorta. You also find on the right side the thoracic duct present on the right side of the aorta in the lower part. At the level of T4, it is going to cross and go off to the left side. 
Some of the other relations can be appreciated. Descending thoracic aorta is related posteriorly to the lower eight thoracic vertebrae. You also find the superior and the inferior hemiazygous veins crossing the midline and ending in the azygous venous system. The azygous vein along with the thoracic duct is present to the right side of the descending thoracic aorta. All three of them will be passing through the aortic aperture in the diaphragm. The thoracic duct is between the azygous vein on the right side and the aorta on the left side. So, this is the descending thoracic aorta. This is the azygous vein and here is the thoracic duct and the esophagus. It comes to lie anterior to the aorta in the lower part. Now, let us look at the branches of the aorta. We have already told the ascending aorta gives off two branches that is the right coronary a branch coming from the anterior aortic sinus and the left coronary coming from the left posterior aortic sinus of valsalva. The arch of aorta gives off three branches. One is the brachiocephalic trunk or the innominate artery which divides into the right common carotid and right subclavian. The next is the left common carotid artery and the other one is the left subclavian artery. These are the branches coming from the arch of aorta. Occasionally it gives the arteria thyroidea ima. The descending thoracic aorta gives off certain branches from its ventral aspect. They are the pericardial, mediastinal and esophageal branches coming from its ventral aspect. You also find paired branches, one is the left bronchial artery, two in number arising from the descending thoracic aorta. The right bronchial artery is an indirect branch. It comes from the third posterior, left, right posterior intercostal artery. You find the descending thoracic aorta gives off the intercostal arteries from 3rd to 11th both on the right and the left. The right posterior intercostal arteries will have to cross the midline and go on to the right side. So, they have a longer course. So, they are giving branches from 3rd to 11th posterior intercostal. The first and second if you recall they are branches coming from higher up that is the superior intercostal artery which is in turn a branch of subclavian artery, the indirect branch of subclavian artery which is in the root of the neck that gives costo cervical trunk and that gives superior intercostal artery which is going to supply the first and the second spaces that is the posterior intercostal. The last one to arise here is the subcostal artery going to the 12th intercostal space. Then you find the superior phrenic artery arising just above the diaphragm before the aorta leaves through the aortic aperture of the diaphragm. It gives off the superior phrenic artery which is going to supply the diaphragm. After this it leaves by passing through the aortic aperture. Let us look at the clinical aspects of aorta. What is coarctation of aorta? Coarctation of aorta means narrowing of aorta. This narrowing can happen in relation to the ductus arteriosus either behind above the ductus or below the ductus. So, if it is proximal to the ductus it is called as preductal coarctation. If it is distal to the ductus, it is called as postductal coarctation. If it is preductal coarctation, it is usually associated with patent ductus arteriosus, and this is not formed the ligamentum arteriosum. So, usually it is found in children preductal coarctation with, with the patent ductus arteriosus, which allows the collateral circulation. If it is postductal coarctation beyond the ligamentum arteriosum, then you find the ductus arteriosus has undergone resorption and it has formed the ligamentum arteriosum, an involuted structure, ligamentum 
arteriosum. So, this postductal coarctation collateral circulation has to happen through the branches of the aorta with the branches which are connecting the lower part. So, you find the posterior intercostal arteries will be enlarged because they are going to communicate with the lower branches and this posterior intercostal arteries which are enlarged can result in notching of the ribs which can be appreciated in x-rays. So, occasionally you find this ductus arteriosus remains patent without undergoing involution. So, there is no formation of ligamentum arteriosum. So, it remains patent. Then what happens is the blood from the aorta will enter the pulmonary artery. It is going to connect left pulmonary artery with the arch of aorta just distilled to the subclavian artery that is the left subclavian branch. So, you find the blood from the aorta will pass through the patent ductus arteriosus and reach the left pulmonary artery. So, there is an overload on the pulmonary circulation and also backward flow towards the right ventricle. So, right ventricular hypertrophy can be seen and there can be pulmonary circulation getting involved. So, a person's pulmonary circulation will be overloaded with right ventricular hypertrophy it can result in cardiac failure. It has to be surgically treated patent ductus arteriosus. Aorta can get enlarged then it is called as aneurysm of the aorta. This can involve either the ascending or the arch or descending thoracic aorta. The wall of the aorta becomes thinned out and there is a fusiform dilatation. The pulsations will be transmitted and a person when is examined with the extended neck and the trachea is palpated, the trachea along with each pulsation of the aorta will be felt to be tugged down. This is called as tracheal tug. So, when you ask the patient to extend the neck and palpate trachea above the suprasternal notch, you find in case of aortic aneurysm, a tracheal tug is felt. Each pulsation, you find the trachea being pulled down. This is called as tracheal tug. Dissecting aneurysm is another type of aneurysm where there is a small tear in the tunica intima and the blood enters the tunica media. This keeps collecting within the tunica media with enlargement of the aorta. Occasionally, it can rupture. This is how it looks in a dissected specimen. So, this is the aorta. Here will be the ascending aorta. This is the arch of aorta with its three branches and this is the descending thoracic aorta. Let us look at the trachea. It is present in the neck and it continues down into the superior mediastinum. So, it extends from the level of the sixth cervical vertebral lower border where the larynx continues as the trachea. It ends at the lower border of T4 or sternal angle where the trachea divides into the right and the left bronchi, the principal bronchi. You find this trachea is kept patent by cartilages which are C-shaped cartilages present within this fibromuscular tube. The posterior ends of these C-shaped cartilages are held together by a muscle which is called as trachealis. It is crossed anteriorly by the arch of aorta and superiorly by the isthmus of the thyroid gland along with the left brachiocephalic vein and the inferior thyroid veins. These are the structures which cross the trachea anteriorly. Posteriorly, it is related to the esophagus. On the right and left side it will be related to the nerves, the right vagus and the phrenic along with the right lung and pleura. On the left side is the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Then you find the branches of the aorta that will be the left common carotid and the subclavian going towards the left side of the trachea. You also find the vagus and the phrenic lateral to it along with the left lung and pleura. The C-shaped cartilages 
when you come towards the end, lower end of the trachea, is, which is about 10 to 11 centimeters in length, will have a projection, the lowermost cartilage, there are about 16 to 20 cartilages and this, the lowest one, will have a small inferior process which will hook the lower end of the trachea and go and get attached to the rest of the cartilage, forming a complete enclosure for this lower end of the trachea near its bifurcation. This is called as carina. Carina will show a small elevation on the internal aspect of the trachea which can be used as a guide when doing bronchoscopy. So this is the arch of aorta anterior to the trachea and here is the esophagus which will be posterior to the trachea. Thoracic duct also crosses the posterior aspect of the trachea from the right to the left side. Tracheal shadow can be appreciated in radiograph before, because of its content that is the air. So air is transu, translucent so it appears dark in color in a plain x-ray. So this can be appreciated. So any shift in the trachea due to mediastinal shift can be appreciated by a plain radiograph itself. Palpation in the suprasternal notch of the trachea will tell you whether the mediastinum is in normal position or it is deviated or shifted to one of these sides. Carina which we have already told you will guide a surgeon while putting a fiber optic scope through the trachea either to do a bronchoscopy or a biopsy. It is also one of the last defense mechanisms of the respiratory system because it has a sensory nerve endings which will stimulate cough when there is a foreign particle entering the trachea. Tracheoesophageal fistula are communications between the trachea and the esophagus. It is a developmental anomaly wherein the septum between the trachea and esophagus is not properly developed. This is a dissected specimen showing the trachea from the superior view of the superior mediastinum. Behind the trachea you find this is the trachea you find the esophagus with a collapsed lumen. Uh, in the front of the trachea you find the arch of aorta. To the right of the trachea you find the superior vena cava. These are the branches of the arch of aorta that is the brachiocephalic trunk and the left common carotid. Behind this will be the left subclavian artery. Let us look at the cardiac plexus, the other structure present in the superior mediastinum. Cardiac plexus is made up of both parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves which are going to supply the heart. There are two cardiac plexuses present, one is superficial and the other one is deep. Superficial cardiac plexus is present just below the arch of aorta in front of the pulmonary trunk division. And this superficial cardiac plexus can have a ganglion present in it that is called as cardiac ganglion of Risberg. The contributions for the superficial cardiac plexus are two in number. One is coming from the vagus and the other one is from the sympathetic. Both come from the left side. You find the left vagus gives the inferior cervical cardiac branch which joins the superficial cardiac plexus and the left sympathetic, the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion gives a superior cervical cardiac branch which joins the superficial cardiac plexus. This superficial cardiac plexus is medial or to the right of the ligamentum arteriosum. And this superficial cardiac plexus will also get connected with the deep cardiac plexus and it also contributes to the left pulmonary plexus and the right coronary plexus. All the other branches of both the vagi and the sympathetic trunks will be joining the deep cardiac plexus. So you find the sympathetic trunk 
the cervical and upper three or four thoracic sympathetic ganglia will give branches they are called as cardiac branches. So, except for the superior cervical sympathetic giving the superior cervical cardiac branch all the other branches of this sympathetic cervical and the thoracic will be joining the deep cardiac plexus along with branches from the right and the left vagus you find the left vagus inferior cervical cardiac branch will go to form the superficial plexus whereas all the other branches of both vagus will contribute to the deep plexus. Where is this deep plexus situated now? It is situated in front of the tracheal bifurcation behind the arch of aorta. If you recall the superficial cardiac plexus was below the arch of aorta whereas the deep cardiac plexus is behind the arch of aorta. Now, this is going to contribute to both right and left pulmonary plexus, to both right and left coronary plexus and it also receives communication with the superficial cardiac plexus. To summarize what we have seen today is the mediastinum and its subdivisions into superior, inferior and further divisions of the inferior. We have seen the applied importance of the mediastinum like mediastinitis, mediastinoscopy, mediastinal shift etc. We have looked at the superior mediastinum and its contents, most important contents being the arch of aorta and the superior vena cava. We also have a, looked at the aorta as a whole, the superior vena cava, the trachea and the cardiac plexus. Thank you. Today we will be looking at the specimen which shows us the mediastinum. Uh, once we split open the manubrium sternum and the sternum, rest of the sternum has been removed, the mediastinal contents have been exposed. So, we can have a look at the structures which are present in the superior mediastinum. And all of you know the lower limit of the superior mediastinum is formed by a plane which runs from the sternal angle to the lower border of T4 vertebra that is the thoracic fourth vertebra. So, you find this is the lower limit of the superior mediastinum and the structures which you can identify here will be this is the vein. Which vein do you think runs across the mediastinum? Yeah, this is the left brachiocephalic vein. It has got a longer course starting from the left sternoclavicular joint it runs towards the right sternoclavicular joint where it unites with the right brachiocephalic vein to form the superior vena cava. This superior vena cava runs in the superior mediastinum from the first costal cartilage till the second costal cartilage. The junction of superior and the inferior mediastinum is at the level of the second costal cartilage. At this level, the superior vena cava is going to pierce this fibrous structure. What do you think this is? Pericardium. pericardium. This is the fibrous pericardium. So, this part of the superior vena cava is extra cardiac, whereas this part, after it pierces the fibrous pericardium, it becomes intra cardiac, okay, intra fibrous structure. So, from the second costal cartilage till the third costal cartilage, you find the superior vena cava lying within the fibrous pericardium and it terminates in the right atrium. Which part of right atrium does it open into? The posterior smooth sinus venarum. It opens into the posterior smooth sinus venarum. So, this is the right atrium. It has a posterior smooth part and an anterior rough part. So, it opens into the posterior smooth sinus venarum. So, this is the superior vena cava. You can see the formative tributaries are the brachiocephalic veins and just before it pierces the fibrous pericardium, you can see a structure coming and ending in the superior vena cava. That is the azygous vein, unpaired vein. It is arching over this structure. What is this? root of the right lung. It arches superior to the root of the right lung and opens into the superior vena cava before it pierces the fibrous pericardium. So, this is superior vena cava. 
and this is the brachiocephalic left side and this is the arch of the azygous vein. You can have a look at this structure which is present in the neck which descends down in the same plane to reach the superior mediastinum. It is a prevertebral structure. It can be felt because it has got cartilaginous rings in it. So, it can be palpated as a, a slightly harder structure and this is the trachea. The upper end of the trachea is the junction between the larynx and the trachea. This is at the level of C6, lower border of C6. Anteriorly, it is indicated by the cricoid cartilage, lower border of cricoid cartilage. From where the trachea descends down, reaches the superior mediastinum, Posteriorly, it is related to esophagus. Anteriorly, it is related to the aortic arch and its branches. At the level of the sternal angle, it is going to terminate by dividing into the two principal bronchi. The lower end of the trachea is the carina. So, this structure here can be seen that is the trachea. This structure is the trachea. The other structure which we can see here is the aorta. So, you find the aorta is the continuation of the aortic vestibule which is a part of the left ventricle. What you see here is the right ventricle which is continuing as the pulmonary infundibulum that becomes the pulmonary trunk. So, this aorta initially the ascending aorta is overlapped by the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk is going to divide into the right and the left pulmonary arteries. The ascending aorta is going to continue as the arch of the aorta. At the junction of the ascending aorta and the arch, which is at the level of sternal angle, you will find a slight bulging of the aorta on the right side. This is called as aortic bulb. This is due to the projectile nature of the blood which is being pumped into the aorta. So, it creates, it creates the aortic bulb. So, from here is the arch of the aorta which runs upwards, backwards and to the left to reach the same level that will be the sternal angle level or the lower border of T4. It is going to give off three branches here. You can appreciate this. This is the brachiocephalic trunk. The other name for this will be the innominate artery. The next one is the left common carotid and this is the left subclavian. After it gives off the left subclavian, the inferior aspect of the aorta is joined to the left pulmonary artery by a ligamentous band that is called as ligamentum arteriosum. That is a remnant of ductus arteriosus which helps in the fetus to bypass the pulmonary circulation directly the blood enters from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta bypassing the pulmonary circulation. So, this is the ligamentum arteriosum. Ligamentum arteriosum is hooked by a branch coming from this nerve. This nerve is the vagus, left vagus. It is going to give off this recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left side that is going to hook around the ligamentum arteriosum and ascend up in the tracheoesophageal groove to reach the cervical region or the neck. The rest of the vagus is descending down behind the lung root. Whereas, anterior to the lung root, what you see is another nerve crossing the aorta. This is the phrenic nerve. In between these two, you will find the cardiac branches. Between the phrenic nerve and the vagus nerve, which cross the aorta, arch of aorta, you will find the cardiac branches coming from the vagus and coming from the sympathetic. So, this is the descending thoracic aorta. You can see a slight variation in the descending thoracic aorta in this specimen. You can see it is slightly curved making a deviation to the right of the midline having a convexity there and coming back towards the midline to reach the aortic aperture in the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm which has been cut open due to dissection of the abdominal contents. So, it is going to enter the aortic aperture of the diaphragm, enter the abdominal cavity and continue as the abdominal aorta. So, this is a slight variation in its course. You can see the branches coming from the aorta which are running towards the corresponding intercostal space. They are the posterior intercostal arteries. 
the right posterior intercostal arteries will have a longer course they have to cross the midline and reach the opposite side whereas the left posterior intercostal arteries will have a shorter course you will find other branches of the aorta but here it is not we will not be able to appreciate it so that completes the lecture on mediastinum 1